My name is Michael Benson. I'm a professor of pediatrics and systems medicine at Linköping University in Sweden. And I'll talk about um, systems medicine for predictive and individualized medicine. And I, I'm sure you, many of you are aware of this, these problems, that uh, a lot of medications for common dry, uh, diseases are not effective. And this costs an enormous amount of money. And um, recently in Sweden there's a debate about a very expensive drug that costs almost 4 million Swedish crowns a year. And a board decided that this drug would not be, gi would not be uh, given for a group of patients with um, a severe disease. So this, this is really a challenge to healthcare. And um, wrong direction. It's also a great problem for the pharmaceutical companies because it's almost, it's almost an untenable disease uh, business model to develop drugs when the costs are so huge. And ideally, we should have diagnostic markers to stratify patients on the first visit, as opposed to now when we ask physicians. We see patients, we make a best guess of which drug is optimal for that patient, and we see the patient repeatedly to try to evaluate if it works or not. The problem is that um, diseases go up and down, and it's difficult to know if it's the drug or it's the disease that changes. So it can take a long time to decide if a, work, a, a drug works or not. And the second step, step which I think is approaching is that we will find markers to predict and treat disease before it becomes symptomatic. And this will in turn lead to improved drug discovery. And uh, I think the pharmaceutical industry is becoming increasingly interested in this. So what is happening now, I think, in recent years, is that there's a shared interest between healthcare, the um, academic research, and pharmaceutical uh, industry to collaborate to reach these goals. And it's important to be aware of this for you, because this... Um, has uh, implications for your research activities. And why haven't we reached these goals? Um, it's of course the complexity of common diseases. You know, thousands of genes change in any given disease in combinations that may might differ between patients that appear to have the same disease. And that may lead to variable response to treatment. And now we have um, omics technologies to measure all genes and gene products on different levels. And this is already reaching the clinic for different diseases like um, genome-wide sequencing is, is widely used in, in uh, hospitals now. And um, for instance in cancer there have been reports that sequencing of um, cancer tumors have led to um, discovery of drug targets for ex uh, for existing drugs that were not originally intended for that particular disease. And also uh, mRNA, there is a commercial kit to um, d uh, to stratify breast cancer based on expression profiling. And now I come to the outline of this talk. So I've already discussed the complexity of common diseases and I will go into systems medical principles to analyze the complexity. Also I give an, uh, I'll give an example and extend that to a generally applicable strategy to analyze common diseases. I'll also go into multi-layer analysis and what that means is that um, uh, it's likely that you will need to integrate multiple different types of information for diagnostic purposes. And the all-important question is, of course, if we can translate this to the clinic. And um, the final point is uh, 
predictive and preventative medicine, which I think will lead to a major change in healthcare and drug development. And finally, we'll have a mystery guest, an unannounced guest, the last point. Uh, next, I'd like to um, promote my own center, Linköping, which is a small town, old town in the middle of Sweden, which in the summer is very idyllic. It looks like this, and it's a bit less idyllic in the winter. And um, this is a bit deceptive because this um, town is also the center of the Swedish um, uh, aircraft industry and um, Saab which um, has uh, constructed a Swedish jet fighter and um, I'm not saying this to promote jet fighting but um, these planes are designed to be highly to be highly maneuverable and to achieve that goal they have to be built unstable so unstable that a pilot cannot control them on his or her own they need a very complex regulatory systems computational regulatory systems that have been developed in collaboration with the university and already 10 or 15 years ago people at Saab asked the, the medical university could these principles not be applied to uh, medical uh, problems and this was the start of a systems medical um, and biological interest at uh, Linköping University. And Linköping University, um, um, a fairly unique feature is that the medical and technical faculties are in the same organization. And the technical faculty is larger than the medical faculty. And there is a large um, investment from a private um, foundation to um, Swedish universities, total of 2 billion Swedish crowns, of which uh, 300 will go to Linköping University to invest in a center for molecular medicine. And um, recruitment will start this year. And I'm saying this because what we are looking for is um, uh, highly competitive uh, young investigators, and uh, including basic and clinical um, researchers and uh, they will give um, be given excellent resources to pursue research in the field of molecular medicine and if you are interested in this please contact me and um, we can discuss <laughs> and it's both for basic and clinical researchers and it's not only for young researchers uh, and also it's it's the home of the Swedish Center for the high performance computing which is of course linked to uh, this um, these kind of problems. So again, uh, common diseases are very complex. And I should say that I will leave this presentation uh, for anyone who is interested on your site. So it does contain references to what I will talk about. And I will skip details. And all the, uh, or most of the stuff I will say, it's uh, is um, given in a review article in Genome Medicine, which is an online uh, journal, which has most of the references. And um, complexity. We talked about multi multiple different sources of information. This is a very interesting cell article from 2014 from the Cancer Genome Atlas Research Network. And this is interesting in that they have managed to um, get cancer researchers from many different centers to collaborate. And um, they have uh, performed multiple different types of omics analysis on tumor samples and collected all that information in a common um, center. And this article dealt with uh, 500 samples from pa patients with uh, thyroid carcinomas and what they did was they m analyzed mutations, copy number alterations, mRNA, microRNAs, proteins and DNA methylation and based on that information they stratified um, these types of cancers into different subtypes with um, clinical implications or therapeutic implications. But 
that information in that article at least it was not really structured in a, in a, in a systematic way and this relates to um, the important problem how do you understand the functions of thousands of genes and use that information to find diagnostic markers and therapeutic targets and this is where systems medicine comes in and um, I'm sure you're aware that this is um, there are many definitions but um, I think that um, it's based on combining omics bioinformatics functional and clinical studies and um, when you talk when it, uh, bioinformatics is mentioned it's often seen as something that you give all your da data to a bioinformatician who returns a set of genes or candidates that you can then work with but I think that type of bioinformatics analysis is becoming obsolete instead the bioinformatician is part of the research team and works with um, the others in a continuous process generating and testing hypotheses so the bioinformatician really has to work very closely with the others functional and clinical um, research and I think you, you are having uh, up from what I heard yesterday you had the same setup in Barcelona and in our center we have the same type of basic structure a core group of young researchers uh, Mika Gustafsson who is uh, responsible for bioinformatics and he is a theoretical physicist from the beginning and Huan Sang is um, an MD who is responsible for clinical translation and uh, Colm Nestor is responsible for omics and they work together on a daily basis and this has proven very effective I mean they in a sh fairly short time they've managed to produce quite a lot of good um, publications and um, they've also reached uh, all have gained um, senior or um, full-time positions within three to four years which might be interesting for you to know as young researchers and the, this core group of course works with many others with the clinicians and uh, a PhD school and we also not only medical students but also other students work together and we recruit PhD students from them and then we have multiple national and international collaborations Ob obviously a very important part is missing from this uh, uh, slide and that should be in this kind of side patients are of course in the in the center of, of this slide and I repeat myself Yes, and uh, the next uh, next slide uh, will cover or describe a very basic uh, uh, simplified graph of, of the principle of, of organizing all that data, which essentially is based on... Um, this might be preaching to the choir. I, I'm maybe you're all aware of this, but there are uh, computational maps of the protein-protein interaction network that can be used as templates to organize... Uh, all the thousands of disease associated genes and if you do that um, you generally find that many uh, disease associated genes are dispersed in the protein interaction networks whereas some that are most likely to be important for the disease are co-localized forming modules and such modules can be used to find diagnostic markers and therapeutic targets and then the next problem is how do you validate modules that contain hundreds of genes I mean you can't really validate each gene one by one I mean it take a century not a century but a long time and you can perform clinical studies to perform to validate in new samples that they actually um, uh, can be um, validated and uh, from a functional perspective one way could be to uh, use blocking technologies to um, block this I in this this idealized idealized case an upstream gene that you have identified in the module and then you perform some kind of high throughput analysis to see to test if the downstream genes 
are affected as this is by by the paler and um, genomic concordance is another important con concept that may or may not be known to you and the idea is that um, if you have a module of mRNAs that change in expression in disease you would expect the corresponding proteins to change or you would expect that there would be an enrichment in disease associated polymorphisms among those um, transcripts and the next slide will show one um, um, plan how to exploit that uh, the idea of genomic concordance developed by a, a PhD student in my group who's now doing postdoc uh, in the US and what he did was in s summary to uh, construct to break down the protein protein interaction network into sub to small modules and then he tested if the he identified modules that were enriched for differentially expressed genes and then he continued to to test if those modules then were enriched for disease associated SNPs polymorphisms so that's a structured approach to uh, to test for genomic concordance and this is an open access uh, journal and inherent in that um, idea is that um, if you think of that cancer slide showing you know all the mRNAs metabolites etc then maybe you can use modules to organize completely heterogeneous sources of information like mRNAs and microRNAs and I'll show you a simplified version of that example of that so these are um, the blue dots here are differentially expressed genes mRNAs from allergen challenge cells from allergic patients T cells and the red dots are microRNAs that target they're also differentially expressed and target uh, these um, uh, differentially expressed mRNAs so this can be seen both as a form of validation but also as a way to understand why are these genes differentially expressed you can use this multi-layer this is just two layers this module to understand this multi uh, or two layered module to understand why are the differentially expressed genes differentially expressed so part of that expression is microRNAs but you can also use the same idea to extend that information to include for instance methylation or polymorphisms or other regulatory factors so that you can trace trace the uh, understand why a particular gene or module is differentially expressed in a patient and you can also use that to understand differences between subtypes of patients so let's say that um, in one subtype of allergic patients the disease module looks like this and in another patient it looks like this then you can use this type of information to understand to check which microRNAs are associated with these differences and you could ideally use either microRNAs or mRNAs to distinguish between the two subgroups and use that information for therapeutic decisions so here you if you start with the lower part of this slide this is the protein protein interaction network and you can identify a module of dif differentially expressed genes and you can build a multi-layer module consisting of things like SNPs epigenetics proteins transcripts microRNAs but in the end as I think you were alluding to is that uh, you can't really diagnose patients only based on on molecular changes you need to know a lot about the patients clinical presentation and the interesting thing is that symptoms and signs can also be arranged in networks that do appear to have a modular structure too so this means that you can extend the multi-layer module to include clinical signs and symptoms and 
you might also be able to extend that to environmental factors so that you have a very complex multi-layer multi -layer module model of a common disease and um, this has similarities to how clinicians um, think about diseases although it's of course much more simplified because uh, you can only, only keep so much information in your head, or at least I can't. But computationally you could use this kind of information and use the module-based uh, approach to organize this kind of information and use it for clinical decision support. And then you could pick up the most discriminating factors from these different layers and identify subtypes that you uh, will be use red or blue medications, different types of medications. And I think this is where we're heading, that we will have computationally based uh, decision support that will be integrated in, for example, electronic medical records. I will get back to that. Of course, there are many problems, and uh, these are some of the many problems of studying complex diseases. The phenotypes are very heterogeneous. I mean, they vary over time, and multiple different factors affect the phenotypes. And you have the complexity of uh, the molecular complexity, and it's difficult to uh, maybe difficult to get uh, the cell type that you are interested in. For instance, a patient with diabetes has a disease of the pancreas, and uh, you cannot really take uh, biopsies of the pancreas. The external causes may be unknown, or there is no animal model, so therefore it might be difficult to model the disease process. And uh, this is why we have focused on seasonal allergic rhinitis as a disease model. Ordinary, it's hay fever. It's a well-defined homogeneous ph phenotype that is very common in Sweden, Everybody, uh, very many, uh, almost 10 to 15 percent of the population develops symptoms of hay fever in late April. And the external cause is known, it's pollen, and we know the disease cells and the readout, which is these two cytokines. We have an excellent animal model, and it can be studied locally in nasal fluids or mucosa without discomfort to the patient. And it's easy to measure the treatment response. And I will now give an example, recent example from uh, how we apply these principles to a study of uh, allergic rhinitis that was published in, published in Science Translational Medicine last year. And here is a brief outline of how the study was designed, which I will abbreviate. So we used a mixture of um, uh, knockdowns and bioinformatic methods and expression profiling to define a disease module in allergy, in allergen challenged T cells from patients. And um, we found that that module, which was defined in uh, TH2 cells from patient, from healthy controls, overlapped significantly with T cells from allergic patients, and this is an example of genomic concordance to validate your findings. And then we proceeded to pick out one particular gene that was novel in the context of algae but had some characteristics made which made it suitable as a candidate. And we proceeded to perform diagnostic and therapeutic students uh, studies in allergic patients. So we studied, we analyzed the protein nasal fluids and. Uh, we treated cells from patients with allergic rhinitis with an antibody directed against this protein and we performed extensive functional studies in uh, a mouse model of allergy <laughs> including uh, treating the mouse with that antibody and this showed that um, the, um, the protein had important uh, functions for, for uh, the disease and also is a can diagnostic and therapeutic candidate in allergy. And the real message here is that by combining 
om, uh, omics, bioinformatics, functional and clinical studies, it is possible to identify diagnostic and therapeutic candidates. So um, this suggested, actually we called this a generally applicable strategy, and we tried if the st strategy was applicable to many other diseases. And this uh, was again uh, the work of uh, uh, this uh, Friedrich Baroness, a PhD student. And um, the question was, if you can identify modules, maybe you can make a map, a module-based map of human diseases and use that as a reference to identify diagnostic and therapeutic candidates. And uh, initially we thought this would look like a geographical map with different diseases um, separated in the PPI network. But that was not the case. Instead, uh, it was more like this. Uh, the, this is just a uh, simplified model, only showing three out of 13 completely different uh, um, complex diseases. And they partially overlapped and formed a shared module which had remarkable properties. That uh, uh, central module was enriched for uh, pathways regulating metabolism, prolifer proliferation and inflammation. And a likely explanation for that is that those pathways are so important for survival and fighting disease that they have to be um, synchronized. A problem with that organization is that dysfunction in one pathway could spill over into the others and cause one or more diseases. And this actually is consistent with uh, many diseases um, tend to co-occur co-occur so comorbidity is a very common problem but how do you test that hypothesis that uh, these three or these three main pathways are involved in many diseases and malfunction in one can spill over to the others well we tested for genomic concordance we we tested if this central module was enriched for polymorphisms identified by um, genome-wide association studies of hundreds of diseases and we, fo we found that it was highly enriched for, for disease associated polymorphisms. So what this means is that a limited number of, of genes are involved in very very many diseases. So that uh, when we analyzed uh, that um, shared module it was uh, enriched for disease associated SNPs for many different diseases and also enriched for diagnostic markers and drug targets so it's it is involved in multiple different diseases so that would suggest that it cannot be used for diagnostics because it cannot separate different diseases but um, actually I will not go into that later but what I can say is that uh, it's not on its own such a um, gene is not very useful for uh, diagnostics but in combinations with many different other genes it is likely to be effective because the combinations differ. So a very trivial comparison would be a football team. You have 11 players but uh, they can be hugely different depending on, on their how they interact. So can we use these uh, modules to find diagnostic markers and therapeutic targets? And we focus on T-cell associated diseases because um, they are common and or fairly common and T cells are fairly easy to obtain from peripheral blood from patients as opposed to for example pancreatic cells from diabetic patients. The next slide is a bit complicated and this uh, relates to your question really. Um, so we wanted to analyze uh, use the strategy on different T cell associated diseases and we identified uh, expression profiling data from eight or nine T-cell associated diseases and tested these strategies. And the next slightly complicated slide uh, described the uh, uh, outline of that study. First, we um, performed a meta-analysis of all GWAS genome-wide association studies. Which pathway is most, most enriched in 
genome-wide association studies. And the, you, you know, there's lots and lots of diseases have been analyzed. And um, there is no, it's obviously a selection of some diseases are more commonly studied than others. So you can't really say that the pathway is most common in common diseases. But we found that the most enriched pathway was actually T cell differentiation, which pointed at uh, T cells at least being important for many uh, common diseases. And that is actually, is actually consistent with T cells being recognized as important for many diseases like atherosclerosis, obesity, apart from you know, inflammatory diseases or known inflammatory diseases. So we did this module-based strategy on T-cells, expression data from T-cells. And again, we found this um, flower-like structure with a shared module. Each, each, mod each disease had its own module, but it was partially shared. And again, that shared module had that um, design with um, a f a metabolic proliferatory, proliferative and inflammatory pathways, enrichment for genome-wide association study genes. And since it's enriched for diagnostic markers and, and um, drug targets, we thought that expression of the shared genes would be useful to stratify patients that did or did not respond to treatment. And we tested that in prospective studies of two different diseases, uh, seasonal allergic rhinitis and multiple sclerosis. And we did find that genes in the shared module could stratify high and low responders to cortisone with high accuracy in allergic rhinitis, but not in multiple sclerosis, which were treated with uh, natalizumab, which is a, an antibody directed against a specific uh, um, gene product. Instead, we found that in multiple sclerosis, uh, genes in the specific module could separate high and low responders. So um, this shows, of course, that the principle of using the shared module only is not generally applicable, but it depends on which genes are targeted by the drug that you are treating the patient with. But using shared and specific modules may be useful to stratify patients. And then um, someone asked about um, only analyzing uh, mRNA, and that relates to the um, this again this very important uh, study of multiple uh, of cancer. So um, mRNA alone might not be sufficient, and this relates to um, multilayer modules. This is actually um, or s appears to be a very effective way of organizing. Um, genomic different uh, layers from different genomic information from different layers and here again is uh, mic uh, the mRNA microarray two layer module system to just highlight the principle but that can be extended to uh, include or potentially be extended to include molecular and clinical information and used for clinical decision support too to stratify patients. And again, I think this is uh, where we're heading. I'd like to continue to um, uh, the multilayer um, analysis. So methylation is, is one genomic layer which is increasingly recognized as having great diagnostic potential. And we recently published in, <coughs> in PLOS Genetics, and I will just summarize to say that um, Methylation of T cells from patients with allergic rhinitis and healthy controls almost completely separated patients and controls. And similar findings have been done in rheumatoid arthritis and some other diseases. So methylation does appear to have a lot of uh, potential diagnostically. And interestingly, um, it's not there is no direct correlation between methylation and mRNA. So they are appear to be partially. Uh, independent, and that suggests that they could be used in combination for diagnostic purposes. And here is also another comp compelling finding. We found that methylation was highly correlated with symptom scores, and those symptom scores were based on patients actually recording disease severity. I mean, th that is a fairly high 
correlation, uh, 0.86 in a clinical study. I know obviously it's a very small study, but still it suggests the potential of methylation. We have actually tried this for many different types of layers, and uh, except we have not tried metabolites, but there is, um, they can, these uh, layers can be organized in modules that are partially um, dependent and partially in in independent. And that means that, suggests that information from the different modules could be extracted. I mean, the most discriminating information from those modules could be extracted and used for very fine discrimination, molecular discrimination of patients. And reaching the, uh, regarding the clinic, uh, I, s I think that the most likely um, um, continuation is likely to be that you integrate different sources of molecular information and you target the omics analysis to only a few um, variables from each layer, the most discriminating uh, molecules. And you use that information for clinical decisions, decision support systems that are integrated into electronic medical records. And there are already uh, medical uh, such decision support systems that can be uh, um, adapted to include this kind of information. Obviously, cost effectiveness calculations are uh, very important. And training, I mean, uh, in most medical schools, uh, medical curricula, there is no information about, or very little information about these type of analysis. And this is uh, one of the objectives of CASIM that I think you heard of earlier this week. And this is a very important aspect, that uh, the cost of uh, omics analysis is increasingly uh, um, decreasing exponentially. I mean, in uh, three years, it's expected to be decreased by 100,000 times compared to 2001, when the human genome was first sequenced. And uh, before the Mr. Guest, I'd like to proceed to um, a very important, I, I think this is a major change in healthcare. Is it possible to predict and treat diseases before they become symptomatic? And that, if so, that would be a major change in healthcare. So, um, what are the some? Here are some examples of the potential, and um, this is a recent study in Nature Medicine, where analysis of ten lipids in serum could predict uh, development, uh, later development of Alzheimer's with great uh, precision. And uh, in the U.S., um, I'm not sure if you heard of the 100K Wellness Project. The aim here is to un analyze 100,000 healthy subjects over 30 years in multiple different uh, stations of the body. For instance, uh, 100 proteins to um, track organ health, health, but also um, physical measurements like pulse physical activity level. And this is achieved by wrist sensors. And I think the mes main message here is that um, by combining f regular physical and laboratory measurements, it might be possible to predict and prevent disease. At least that is the objective of this study. And uh, then there is um, Obana's, Obana, this is another word, precision medicine, uh, which um, probably means individualized medicine. And the idea is to create a research cohort of one million patients or not patients, healthy subjects, who will share this kind of data. <coughs> and this interesting combined diet, lifestyle information and linked to electronic health records. To they are not using the um, multi-module, the multi-layer module to organize the data, but that concept could be used to, to organize that kind of data. And then there is uh, another, this is our own hypothesis-based approach <coughs> in which we use bioinformatics to, if we can identify a mod disease module in any given disease, which we can, then we can use the same techniques to identify potential early regulators of that module 
and ideally use those early regulators, measure those regulators to predict and ideally prevent disease. And we have a preliminary study of seasonal allergic rhinitis and multiple sclerosis that do support uh, the feasibility of this uh, um, approach, which is now under revision in, in uh, science translation medicine. And here is a slide that um, to a toy model of the idea. Here you have a disease module. And this module is based on known interactions between different genes in the module. And those interactions can also potentially be used to trace early regulators of each gene in the module. And we use gene regulatory networks to, to um, define early regulators. And if you can define those early regulators, then maybe you can treat them early in the disease process and thereby prevent disease. And um, so if you take this to its extreme and you envisage that all the ethical and social problems can be solved, this will result in a major change in healthcare from these huge battleship-like hospital structures to a more, um, what you call it, um, um, decentralized healthcare organization where patients are monitored regulatory, uh, regularly with uh, bio uh, biomedical and um, physical measurements. So now I'm going to venture in to say something even more controversial. And um, because of the time limit, I, I, will not have, I will not be able to go into all the ethical and social reservations. And also, we have, must uh, give time for our mystery guest. <coughs> So um, here is an idealized scenario. You start with individual baseline consisting for each individual we're interested in participating in such healthcare programs. You get a baseline of fam family history and omics and physical measurements and use that as a starting point. And then you perform regular multi-layer measurements laboratory and physical. And I should say, as, as you were into, these, th these can be performed, uh, physical measurements can be performed by um, simple devices, like, um, like a watch-like device. And um, samples can be achieved fairly early, <laughs> easily in, in outpatient settings. And then, if this turns out that you can actually accurately predict disease before it becomes symptomatic, not as in present uh, what we have in today's situation, then you could have potentially have early repeated systems oriented interve interventions like combining lifestyle factors, different combinations of drugs and environmental agents. And um, so not only drugs, but also environmental agents. So in many diseases, we know the uh, environmental cause, obesity, I mean, if you eat too much, you become fat. And in allergy, you know that uh, the external agent, like, for instance, pa pollen. And in both obesity and um, allergy, you can use the env environmental agent to halt the disease. I mean, in obesity, you can stop eating so much. And in allergy, you can actually treat allergic patients by giving repeated doses of the allergen over a period of time and actually cure the patient. So maybe that kind of combination can be used to uh, halt disease before it becomes symptomatic. And another thing that uh, Tim alluded to is, is uh, that uh, diseases are processes. And um, when I was young, a young physician a long time ago, one, one of the um, most shocking experiences was um, uh, a child with meningitis, an infant with man meningitis, who came in uh, fairly ill and within 15 minutes we did everything we could you know give gave the treatment but three hours later that uh, infant was dead and um, um, it's obvious that that was a very dramatic process with um, rapid changes in inflammatory um, mechanisms over those three hours 
And had we known, had we been able to monitor those processes over time and intervene with those processes effectively during those hours, three hours, maybe we could have changed the outcome. And uh, it, that might be very difficult over the span of three hours. But if you're taking thinking of a disease that takes months or years, maybe then you could perform complex interventions that are specifically directed at a specific time point of the disease process. And I believe this is feasible based on, combi on interaction between uh, healthcare, academic research and the pharma. And uh, in the interest of time I will not uh, go into detail and summarize by saying that a module-based translational strategy may be un uh, applicable to understand mechanisms and identif identify diagnostic uh, markers and therapeutic targets. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the co-workers. Thank you very much.